children in Jim, in I'm going to interrupt you because you're saying no deaths at uh, sea, but here's a, a, a questioner who says there are deaths in Australia. Uh, Shikufa Tahiri. Uh, my father came to Australia on a boat in 1999, while I myself came to Australia as a refugee in 2006. Um, as someone who works with the Refugee Council of Australia and as someone who works really closely with the refugee communities, I see the aftermath of government policies unfold and manifest itself in the communities in Australia. A kind of endemic that's unfolding itself before the nation's eyes. Uh, detention, temporary protection visas, a lack of family reunion, citizenship delays, um, lack of certainty, prolonged delays in processing, are driving people into self-harm and suicide. In the Hazara community alone, in the past 12 months, there have been six cases of suicide and self-harm. Um, my question is to Jim Mullen. Um, to stop the boat, is it necessary and is it worthy to push these asylum seekers, the 30,000 of them in Australia, to such extent? Is it worthy to do that just in order to stop the boats? Uh. Keep it brief, Jim, because we want to hear from other panellists too. So. I, 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 I don't connect the two. You can connect the two. I don't connect the two. I mean, a hang on a sec. Temporary protection visas are part of the system. Oh, absolutely. A key part of the system. Because if you come illegally to this country, uh, you must not benefit from coming illegally because regardless of... So, what, so, well, so can we just <laughs> we'll go back? Because you are connecting the two, aren't you? Why? Right, Tell us why. Right. So in order to stop the boat, what I'm asking is, is it necessary to punish the 30,000 asylum seekers who are already in Australia with us here in our community, who are, if given a chance, can resettle into the country successfully, like my family did, like thousands of other families did back in the early 2000s? Shakufa, can you explain, are you making a connection between the suicides in your community that you've seen and the policy? That's what we're trying to get to Correct. the Correct. Um, I think that um, the rate of suicide and the rate of self-harm is a direct result of the policies that are being uh, imposed on them, uh, the kind of policies that they're being subjected to. It is the endemic result of prolonged delays, prolonged uncertainty, prolonged um, uncertainty when adults cannot make decisions for their lives in the next two or three years. Okay, before we come back to you, Jim, sure. I want to hear from others. So, um, Hugh. Look, I think Jim makes a very uh, clear point that the, the pillars of the sovereign borders, uh, including temporary protection visas, are critical for stopping the boats, right? I think you've sort of repeated that point several times. I guess the question facing us as a, as a country and, and, and our policy makers, is there a better way of doing this, OK? There's no... No one is in favour of people drowning at sea, no one. Um, but when you take $10 billion, you take the ramifications of what the current policies uh, in the way it's stacked up, and you take the ingenuity that I think collectively we as a country ought to have, is there a more effective way of doing this? The Labor Party thought there was, and look what happened. No, I don't think, with all due respect is. to the Shen, Labor Party... Shen, Shen, Shen's just done uh, something called the Gribble Argument. Um, you've addressed this question. Um, give us a brief, a brief, <laughs> if you can, um, <laughs> version of why you say there is an alternative. Well, I think there's an alternative because when you understand that we take 800,000 people a year and we have done so since Prime Minister John Howard, the highest intake in history, it's because we know it turbocharges our economy and contributes to our society. So, 800,000 per year. Migrants. This shouldn't be news to you. No. 800,000 per year. No. 200,000. This is the problem. Because of the limitations of knowledge. Because, because of the limitations of knowledge from some of the people who were the architects of sovereign boards, and I include the Labor Party because they should have come up with it themselves, they asked the question without knowing the tools we have available. Now, Hugh is completely right. If the problem is people taking a dangerous journey and if we have people in our detention centres who tried every formal way and we blocked them, why don't we just use the available tools we have? Why don't we open up existing migration pathways? Why don't we use some of that $10 billion and throw it towards giving some stability and processing in the region? It would barely touch the sides. We could throw a billion dollars at it in aid. It wouldn't touch the sides of the spend of what we're currently doing now. We could do all of those things and it's been demonstrated both historically in our own current experience and elsewhere across the world that it would work. And the question we've got now is, 
Why can't we have the conversation about doing better? I'm not going to say every single one of these things will work in and of itself, but Jim, if there's a way of doing this better, if we don't need to spend $10 billion, if we don't need the suicides of people, if we don't need child abuse, would you be willing to come to the table and talk about it? Talk Absolutely. about a possibility. Right, Absolutely. I'll take you up on that. Absolutely, and, and, and we have... Come to a summit. You're my first invite. Absolutely, and bring Malcolm ladies and Turnbull gentlemen. with you. And this is, this is not an academic activity for me. I have done this for real. I have done this from first principles and gone through and produced something which works. There is a cost, but it works. It has saved lives and it's restored the faith of the Australian people in their migration policy, which is 200,000 people mm. per year, 192,000 people per year. It completely ignores all of the temporary uncapped migration that John Howard was the architect for, which is Can, can we just go, the fact checkers are going to be uh, all over uh, this one. Do. <laughs> is there anyone who can um, shed a light on this side of the table on these figures that we're talking about? 800,000 a year sounds like so, an extraordinary Yeah, I mean, if I could amount, also it... just take the point that I don't think it's an academic experience for Shakufa or for Hugh or for all and the I'm other people who've been was. through. I'm I'm saying it wasn't for me. I said it was a real experience okay. for me. All right, fair enough. Well, I think in terms of the figures, it would be that the 192,000 cover those who migrate to Australia permanently, some on business visas, some on family reunions, some on humanitarian. Now, I take it that Shen's point is there are another 600,000. I didn't know there were so many, mm. but they come on all sorts of temporary visas. They're here for a short term to do a bit of business or pay years, a visit to people years. and then they go home. Well, they don't necessarily. At this point in time, there were 1.5 million temporary migrants who've been here for a number of years in this country. But I think it goes well, and the greatest to... overstayers have always been the Brits. Yes, but they're not, they're not even... The point, Shen, I think, Are you is... saying that this, it, when you hear Pauline Hanson say were being overrun. Mm -hmm. Is she looking um, at this broader picture? I'm looking around, I'm seeing a lot of people who aren't from Australia. That's her view. And I think this is part of our political problem we've got here. This shouldn't be news to, to people on the panel, especially not Jim Nolan. And what we've had, and what we've had quietly, and that's why I term it the, the great con in the speech, is that we've had an incredible migration program uh, over the last 15 years that has gone under the radar. And politicians haven't wanted to tell us because they haven't been brave enough to say, it's incredible, it's successful, it's needed for this country. And the great irony is we sit here as a community, many, I can see in the faces in the audience, many people migrants in the audience, migrants no doubt on the table here, and we demonise people who come here seeking a better life when most of us did anyway. What is so wrong with that? What is wrong is when people come in a dangerous way and what is wrong is when we don't have a managed orderly process. But if we can do it for 800,000 people right now, then I dare say we could do it for 25,000 others, which was the hype of who came during the boat arrival. OK, Jim. Well, uh, I, 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 see what, I see what you're saying now. I understand you're 800,000 people. I don't see the relevance of it in relation to this. There is a pathway now which is working, which is getting bigger. The fact that we had Operation Sovereign Borders allowed us... It is a pro-migration policy. It allowed, it, it allowed us to expand the, uh, uh, the intake, not just to the 18,750 that I talk about that is now permanent, but to the 12,000 Syrians anyhow. So, just very briefly, and I just want to go back to the question that was asked earlier, because did, I didn't get to come back to you to respond to the idea that people are actually killing themselves out of despair in this country. Uh, that's what was suggested there. Now, if that were the case, if that could be proven, would you rethink your support of the temporary protection arrangements? Well, we, we have uh, a good Hazaras who have, co who's come from in, who have come from uh, Afghanistan uh, on the basis that they had a well-founded fear of persecution and we're saying their trauma is because of uh, our policy. You know, uh, I would need that to be justified to me. Uh, well, we've still got our questioner there. Do you think you can justify it? Um, well, within the Hazara culture in Afghanistan, despite uh, the very you know, precarious situation in Afghanistan, suicide is not a norm in, in Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, it, people wonder, people are somewhat bewildered in Australia, this endemic type of in, the, um, suicide is happening in the community in the last 12 months. And I think that it's the kind of uncertainty, it's a kind of um, restriction that they're facing that drives them uh, to such extent of self-harm and suicide. I mean, I consult with uh, communities 
really closely. And I, in fact, heard from an Adelaide community member, a Hazara person, saying that um, I am woken up in the middle of the night um, by someone banging their head on the wall. And I ask them, what's happening? What's wrong with you? And they tell me that I don't know what to do with my life. My family is trapped in a war-torn country. And I'm here, stuck in a processing limbo. What should I do? I I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to throw that to, for final comments really, to uh, the rest of the panel on this side, because we are pretty much out of time. So, Hugh. Uh, uh, um, whether you can directly connect suicide, you've got to um, look at the circumstances and believe that the level of depression and despair from not being able to build your life has to be real, okay? I don't think anyone can deny that. And the question is, why do we do that? Um, when um, different solutions exist. Um, you said before, Jim, that if we, if we set up a regional uh, a facility in uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, that it would uh, lead to millions coming down this way. Not necessarily the case, particularly if we take some of those billions of dollars and invest it in, in building up the infrastructure and camps and processing facilities, facilities closer to the source country where, no, where they are, like Jordan no. or Pakistan, okay? No. So that's one thing. Second thing is that by put, bringing money and a vision to the table, we can arm wrestle Japan and South Korea and other countries in our region to participate in the solution. Because right now we're pushing everyone away I and mean, this is where we are. Now, you know, you might say, yeah, that's naive. But I think if you're actually um, talking to the people who work at UNHCR and other NGOs around the area, I think people are looking for a solution. And off the back of that, Australia, through a combination of government-sponsored refugees and private-sponsored refugees, we can probably increase our uptake, uptake north of 30,000 a year, plus add to that the other pathways that are available through, through these 800,000. And we then start to build the next generation of workforce and people who really want to make a contribution. And getting back to Terry's point, that's how we go part of the way in solving our budget and, de and deficit problem, right? We need people who are going to be net contributors to the country and people who are really motivated to build a life okay, for themselves. We need brief answers from our last panellists. Thank you. Whenever we commit troops to war in places like Afghanistan, we Australians should then extend special privilege to those who flee persecution from those theatres of war, and we should do it for at least twice the length of time that we leave our troops there, because our troops are there in what we think to be the national interest, and so we should look to your interests as well. Jane. If refugees waited for the so-called solution that Jim is proposing, they would be waiting over 150 years before the current situation would be resolved. That's the kind of solution which really is no answer whatsoever. In 1949, 48% of Australia's overall migration intake were refugees, and that helped build Australia into the nation that it is today. So why don't we give a fair go to the refugees today who need our help and also help turn Australia into an even more flourishing, prosperous country? Well, Jim, I'll give you the final word. Um, it'll have to be brief, but really the question for you, I suppose, is listening to this. Um, do you find any reason at all to moderate, change, alter your views? For two reasons, Tony, no. The first reason is that the need exists now. Operation Sovereign Borders going into the future is the new normal. There are 14,000 people waiting for weakness on our part to cross, to cross, uh, in, to, to, for the people smugglers to sell them to cross into Australia. First, so that's the first point, need. We need Operation Sovereign Borders and that's the new normal. Uh, the second point is that no one should ever think that Australia is not doing its bit in relation to this. We heard today, those of you who had the pleasure of listening to the Trump uh, uh, Clinton debate today that silly old Trump criticised Clinton for increasing the US refugee intake from 10,000 to 65,000. The US is only taking 10,000 per year. I was absolutely astonished at that. We are the third largest taker of permanent set, uh, settlers in the world. We are leading the world. No Australian should feel uh, embarrassed about what we're doing for refugees in the world. Um, I'm going to have to uh, leave the discussion there. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Jim Molan, uh, Shen Narayana Sama, Sami, uh, Jane McAdam, uh, Frank Brennan and Hugh Trong. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>